Hello, welcome everyone to another live stream, One More Epoch Live. And today it's a, it's a special event. I mean, for a couple of reasons. One is because uh, we've been off for a while, right, Artie? Yeah, so uh, welcome. I was going to say this is our third and a half show, if you count the previous AMA where we were behind the scenes. So it's nice to be back on camera. Yeah, I'm really excited, actually, because we've been off. I mean, I guess it was summer. It was summer for everyone. There was a, a bunch of people on holiday and so on. So we just decided to, like, uh, take it slow over the summer. But uh, we're back, and I'm excited. I've got a new studio here. You can see that you know, I'm in a different place. Uh, new microphone, new camera. It's all new. Uh, but the same there. Alessandro, but the same Alessandro. But the same Alessandro, yeah, exactly. And the same Artie. So yeah, still still with us. I mean, you stuck with us, but uh, you get new backgrounds sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we've and had, today, honestly, yeah, it's been, uh, this season so far has been really exciting. We've had guests like Benjamin Kabe of Microsoft, Rob Lauer and Brandon Satram of Blues Wireless. We had the AMA with some of the most prominent names in the industry a few weeks ago. But today really excites me because if we're in our space, it's really hard not to recognize one of the more you know prolific guys in this industry, which is Sean Heimel. Um, and yeah, anywhere on Twitter, everywhere you go, you see Sean. Whether it's a DigiKey series, whether it's our own you know Coursera courses, Sean's everywhere. So we're really, really excited to have him as our guest today, and where we're going to talk about computer vision, data augmentation, and a few of his other projects. So, um, Sean, welcome. Hello, and Sean. yeah. Sean. Thanks for having me in the the wonderful intro there. Um, <laughs> you I didn't have to say, say I, yeah. no, no. Uh, I am. I've been having a lot of fun with embedded machine learning over the past year or so that I've been tinkering with it, um, and I love what Edge Impulse is doing. This is not just a shameless plug um, because you guys are really making it easy to use. Um, I was doing it on my own where I was actually writing you know, uh, uh, full scripts using TensorFlow and Keras and then trying to port everything. And then I try this edge impulse thing and it's just, I click a button, my thing is trained and I automatically have a, a model ready to deploy to my device. I'm like, yeah, this is what we need to go towards. <laughs> so it really just makes my project so much easier to do. And once again, that is not a plug, you know, we no. Didn't, uh... <laughs> no advertisement whatsoever. But, you know, I think that's testament to you know, how we try to make the complex easy. And, you know, yourself, right? You're, you weren't an embedded, uh, you know, machine learning engineer. So maybe tell for the ones that don't know about you, just provide a little bit of a background. And then, you know, what drew you into this embedded ML space? I think that'd be a good way to start. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, I would say I am, was an, an embedded engineer to start. Um, computer engineering, embedded engineering, or uh, electrical engineering for my undergrad and, and graduate degrees. So I, I've definitely studied this space. Um, I worked at SparkFun for a while where we developed a lot of Arduino libraries, putting together development boards. Um, I moved into the marketing side of things where I got to do videos and content and social media and blog writing and all those things that go into the marketing stuff. And I really enjoy teaching. And from there, that's where I got into teaching some of the um, embedded side of things. A lot of a lot of programming, because I find that's the area that trips up a lot of people coming from the hardware background, um, getting into things like embedded coding. Um, and then I started, once I, I left SparkFun, got into uh, doing videos for DigiKey, and that's where I really started going, okay, I need to move away from this um, more, more beginner space, which is great. I love teaching beginners. I still love teaching beginners. I still have an Arduino course out there um, that uh, helps a lot of people. And it was, okay, this is DigiKey where they're appealing to more professional engineers who probably know the basics and want to get involved in intermediate or more advanced concepts. And that's where I started doing things like real-time operating systems. I'm working on a series now that's for um, embedded Linux, and that's been a fun adventure. And so in this space, I go back to what I previously studied but never got to use, and that was digital signal processing. I actually specialized in DSP in my master's degree, and it was, it was looking at different signal patterns and trying to classify signal patterns using hidden Markov models. Like that was actually my thesis. The funny thing about that is what I didn't know at the time is that was machine learning. That was like, I just never used that term in my paper because I think at the time around 2010, machine learning was something the like theoretical computer scientists did in, in you know, like in Google and, and classifying images of cats, because that's what was being worked on at the time. I just didn't know what I was doing was machine learning. Um, in the electrical engineering lab I did this in, 
we didn't call it machine learning. It was just classifying signals using hidden Markov models. But yeah, it was machine learning. And specifically what I was doing was trying to parallelize algorithms for graphics cards, um, specifically programming stuff in CUDA, which is like their language at the time was kind of like C++ and they had C++ plugins. So it was a lot of really low level stuff that I was doing, but I got it working, wrote my thesis, hooray. That kind of just, you know, sat in a corner for a while. I worked at SparkFun, did all of that, you know, started teaching more. Machine learning started coming around and I started, I want to say it was like 2017, I started seeing inklings of it of like, oh, you can kind of run it on a Raspberry Pi. And that's where I'm like, this is going to be run on microcontrollers soon. And people are going to be doing simpler, more niche applications with it. And I'm like, I need to learn this. And I started... I started off with a course on Coursera, Andrew Eng's course, um, which is an amazing background. You learn the math behind neural networks. Um, that's a great course if you want to get like underlying information about neural networks, how to train them. Um, I took that. Um, that was a you know I enjoyed that course. I'm like, oh my goodness, this this is where things are going. This is basically what I did for my thesis, and I just didn't realize it. And that's where I started going into learning. Yeah. I wanted to jump in. I wanted to jump in a second because I I completely understand where where you're coming from because I did a thesis on on actually uh, digital signal processing, right? And what's what's really interesting is is how far we've gone in just a few years, right? Like, I mean, okay, it's it's a bit more than a few years, but it's not that long actually, right? It's uh it's we've gone from writing a I mean, my thesis was on a DSP and I wrote assembler. Uh, to actually generate the code that was actually running on the DSP to do the digital signal processing, right? So, uh, and I had to like, I had to write the maths myself. I had to figure out like, you know, in MATLAB, what the calculations were, the right calculations, uh, how to like put it on the on the DSP itself. And it was it was complicated, right? Like, I mean, I remember like going through all the, the, dif- the different um, memory uh, of the, you know, I actually looking at the bits changing in the in the DSP memory, so that I could check that actually the algorithms were working right. Yeah, and we've gone from that to actually having uh, tools that can enable you to uh, to really kind of make sense of data without having to worry too much about the uh, the intricacies of the maths, right? And I think that's that's super cool because now we're like really kind of opening up to a lot more people uh, being able to do these things, right? And that, that kind of brings me to my question. Um, You've done a first course, right, on Coursera now, right? Uh, and we're going to talk about your second course in a second. But how have you, you know, what was the response from the audience? Like, it was called Introduction to uh, Machine Learning. Actually, you probably know the name. Uh, embedded, you're, you're close. Uh, introduction to Embedded Machine Learning was go. the first one. And what was the response from the audience? I mean, how many people already knew about machine learning versus how many people didn't know about machine learning? And, and how, you know, how much... How excited were they when, when they figured out that they could actually do this stuff? Um, a lot of a lot of really good responses. You know, the biggest comment that I got was more, please more, um, which is why it's like, okay, developed a second course, um, <laughs> uh, which was really, really great to see. And I'm glad that people are enjoying that course. Uh, There's only like one or two others out there that kind of cover this topic. And I saw a number of people coming to my course who had a background in machine learning. And I I do my best, at least when the course is initially launched, to make sure I like read through who's coming to the course. I ask them like, hey, give me a little bit about your background. Um, I try to engage with them a little bit when they're first coming in as I'm working on another course that dies down and I'm there mostly to answer questions um, and help people troubleshoot problems. But um, what I noticed is there are a number of people with machine learning backgrounds and I was like, hey, this course might be a bit of a review for you. Because what I determined is that I mostly aimed the course at people with embedded background or interest in embedded stuff. So likely they've seen Arduino, they've tinkered with an Arduino, and they're coming to this course. And what that means is I need to teach them yeah, more. I'm getting another comment. Yes, please, more. So, um, they've had some of that embedded background. And what what's... The confusing part is that machine learning, right? That's still a black box mystery to a lot of people. So what I have to do is find a way to go, okay, here's what you need to know about machine learning to become a practitioner of it. You don't need to understand uh, gradient descent down to you know solving for particular gradients in TensorFlow or even by hand. 
um, because we have tools to do that for us. And there are other courses if you want to go into the math behind it. But how can I get you up and running and learning the important parts of it, especially how to collect, curate data, look for biases, balance your data sets like that ends up becoming more important than just, oh, I need to know all the little you know, multiplication and additions and how to set up an exact neural network because really it's a lot of trial and error. I, I build a model, go, does it work? Tweak some of your hyperparameters and go, does this work better? Um, if you really understand the math, you can un start understanding what some of the representations are between your layers and you can start figuring out your own models. But that's when you start getting into real research. Um, we have these complicated models coming out like YOLO. Um, what was the other big one? I'm thinking of like SSD, but like your single ImageNet. shot detection. ImageNet, thank you. Um, all of these different models are mobile net. That's what I was thinking of. So you have these mm -hmm. models and people like researchers know the individual representations and how you can tweak those to make the model run faster more accurate and so on. But this is like people's PhD research where they get published in, in periodicals or, or conferences for this kind of stuff. Um, so in reality, what you're probably doing is starting with a model that somebody else has created and tweaking it to your purposes. And it's a lot of trial and error to figure out does it work? And then deploying that. So really the hard part is understanding how to use the model, how to collect your data and how to deploy it. And that's where I focused on, that's what I focused most on in that first course and getting people just familiar with that process. And there's not even a lot of coding in that course. It's really like you're running these demos and you're kind of going, okay, does this data set work or not? And I challenge people to tweak the code that comes from Edge Impulse because Edge Impulse provides a number of demos, especially for Arduino. And it goes, okay, hey, make a, make a light blink if you captured this keyword. And that's a good first start for people um, just to see, oh, here's how I can start training my own models using a tool set without having to know really what's going on with something like gradient descent in your, in your training. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think that's the power, right? Like, you mentioned something really interesting uh, or really useful, I think. Sometimes, like, you know, to, to actually get stuff done, you have to, like, kind of accept that you're not going to understand everything, right? Like, I learned that at university, uh, you know, when I was, when I was studying, I, I had this, uh, this friend of mine that had, her dad was a, a maths professor, right? And, you know, even though he was a maths professor, he used to tell her, don't, don't worry, if you don't, understand any, if you don't understand everything, don't worry about it. Like, you know, it will come. In the meantime, like, don't stop, right? Like, keep on going, keep on testing, keep on trying. And eventually, you know, you might understand more and you'll get to a point where you'll understand everything if you want to, but you don't have to get to that point right away, right? Like, and, and I think your, your point of, of like tweaking and, and really kind of trying stuff out and getting stuff to work, I think is the, is, the, is the driver really to like get to that next level, right? Because it's only, I think, you know, sometimes people drop out, I think, when they can't figure out the first step, right? If you can help them to figure out the first step, it's much easier to then get them to figure out the next step and the next step, right? So so I think what you're doing is great because your courses are, you know, introduction, yes, but they're also actually getting people to um, really explore what's possible, right? Like with uh, with simple uh, examples and and with, uh, uh, with, with the background as well, or that they need to understand in order to do those examples, right? So I think this is actually a good segue into uh, your second course that you just launched, right? So um, there is this course is all about computer vision, and uh, and it's interesting because you've done the first course that's introductory, and now you've got the second course that's all about computer vision. So first question is, you know, I think the first question that comes to mind is, does someone have to do the first course to do the second, or are they separate? What what, what is your advice? So my advice is yes, you probably should take the first course unless you have a machine learning background. If you if you know what a neural network is and you kind of have an idea of you know how to collect, curate a data set, how to train something, even using edge impulse uh, to, to black box the whole thing, that's probably all you need to know to take the second course. We review it in like the first week and while applying it to um, images to make an image classifier. So the whole the whole purpose of the second course is diving into using machine learning for vision applications, computer vision. Um, computer vision is a, a very big field that's been around since like the 50s or 60s. I talk about the history a little bit. And I don't remember some of it right now, but it's been around for a while. And the idea is, can we use computers to 
interpret images for us, whether that's filtering, finding objects, trying to figure out distances based on size of objects or maybe stereoscopic. And a lot of this is useful for robotics, things like self-driving cars or trying to find where an object is so I can pick it up. Um, just trying to help computers interact with the world around us. And there is a bit of an overlap with machine learning in that there are some machine learning techniques we can apply to computer vision problems, especially when it comes to image classification and object detection, figuring out, oh, I'm looking at a thing. What is this thing that I'm looking at? And machine learning is a very useful tool to help us do that. So in this new course, we apply those techniques to images we don't really do it to video segments, although you do get a live feed, which is just a bunch of images and it's just trying to classify them as fast as it possibly can. So in that case, yeah, we're classifying stuff in a video feed, but it's really just image classification um, and object detection. And if you're, if you're not familiar, image classification is where I take an entire image and I try to determine what that image is about. If there are, if say cat versus dog, but if there's a cat and a dog, it really confuses it if it's only been trained for cat or dog, if that makes sense. It might pick up one or the other or just go, I, I don't know. Um, as opposed to object detection where it scans across the image um, using a variety of techniques and it tries to pick out objects and go, oh, that's a kite, that's a human, that's a car, that's a dog, depending on which objects you've trained the model to look for. So we look at both of those in this second course and to go into that, yeah, you should probably know a little bit about machine learning and everything I cover in the first course should be good enough to take this second course. So if you don't know machine learning, take the first one. If you do have some background in it and you kind of know how to work with Edge Impulse or some other tools, yeah, feel free to take the second one. It's so essentially it's, it's uh, 201, it's course 201. You know? Yes, exactly. And they're both free, saying, right? Okay. Like we should say, sorry, Artie. I was just gonna say that we should say that they're both Free courses, right? So you can just attend them for free on Coursera. How does it work with the? I've seen that you know some people are displaying, showcasing their um, their certificate. How does that work? Sure. So it's a free course. Everything in the course is free. All the projects, all the quizzes, all the videos. Um, you can get a paid certificate, and this is useful because it's an official Coursera certificate that you can display on LinkedIn, show your employer that you're continuing your training. Um, and I'm sure there's, you know, some societies that like to see continuing education, and this could potentially be a, a way to do that. Um, it also helps support both Coursera, Edge Impulse, and myself as an instructor because I get some of that revenue. So it's always appreciated when people do chip in for the certificates. Cool. Sounds good. And I think you mentioned um, something interesting, right? Like. I was going to ask you actually the question you brought it up before I asked you a question. So perfect. Uh, but I was going to kind of dwell into this a little, a little bit more, the, the difference between object detection and uh, classification, right? So um, it's interesting because in, uh, I think people are just always assuming that object detection is, is, you know, it's something people are used to object detection, right? But actually on, on microcontrollers, is it possible to do object detection today, Sean? In theory, yes. I have not seen it. What I ran into was that TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers doesn't support a couple of the operations needed for a few popular object detection models, like that mobile net with SSD that does the single shot detection, which would probably be the model that you would go to, that or like YOLO V3 or YOLO V4. Those are probably your, your top models that are used for mobile applications, when I say mobile, I mean like smartphones and potentially embedded devices, it's, it's, we're so close. In fact, we're so close. I was like, I want to show this in the course. It's just not quite supported. So there's like a placeholder in the course for like coming soon, um, you know, object detection on the open MV cam whenever my, you know, TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers supports those particular models. It's going to be slow. I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be painfully slow think like less than a frame a second because right now the raspberry pi 4 does support mobile net ssd it does support yolo you know surflow light that is meant for like mobile raspberry pi those types of you know single board computers full processors and then there's tensorflow light for microcontrollers which is a subset of that tensorflow light library 
And TensorFlow Lite does support most of these operations, which allows me to do object detection. And in the course, we do object detection. We deploy it to a Raspberry Pi 4. It's MobileNet V2 with uh, single shot detection, or it's single shot detection with a MobileNet V2 head, I think is the technical name for it, if I remember. Backbone, backbone. I got to remember my terminology here. Um, it works. It gives you about one to two frames per second using, um, I think it was like 320 by 320 resolution, full color resolution with your Pi camera. Um, I've seen videos where people are doing, I think, MobileNet V1 and they're getting like four to five frames a second. That's not including plugging in one of the like Google Coral accelerators where then you get like 20 frames a second because those things are specially made to do that type of object detection. Um, so that's where we are right now. And I'm really hoping we see it on things like ARM Cortex M7s in the near future. Just expect it to be small, uh, expect it to be slow. But sometimes slow is all you need. If you just need to say, I every second I need to know where a human is in this frame, that might be a good enough application or a good enough um, solution to whatever you need to get done. Sounds sounds good, and I, I agree with you. I haven't seen it yet, but I'll, uh, I'll I, I hope I, I, sorry, not I hope I wish I had now a video that I could kind of pop up and say you know news news flash or something. Um, I used to have that in, in my old live stream, but we don't have it yet. Uh, but, you know, if you're interested in this topic, object detection on microcontrollers, I recommend you come and watch out Imagine, our next conference, because there might be something there uh, for you. So just saying it, you know, just, uh, just putting it out there. So, yeah, I mean, I think we haven't actually covered that or we haven't told people about Imagine um, yet, but it's... Uh, at the end of this month, we have uh, an awesome conference where there's going to be some really cool announcements. And uh, uh, we're going to have Sean with us as well doing a, a workshop. And there's going to be, it's going to be three days. The first day is going to be all um, talks from, uh, from leaders in the industry. Uh, the second and third day are going to be uh, a couple of panels, really interesting panels on specific topics to, dwell, to like really dive into uh, what some of the challenges are to deploy machine learning on on devices in different fields, and also uh, really talk about you know what can we do differently to to enable even more developers to uh, to work on this to, to actually deploy things to devices. Uh, we're gonna have some some of the you know most interesting names in this space uh, talk at our conference, um, and I, I say our conference, but actually uh, it's not just our conference. is an embedded ML conference uh, where you know we really hope to bring together the people. Uh, that are actually doing things uh, in practice all over the space. Because there's and, been so uh, much exciting stuff. Like this is this is a celebration of everything that's happening in our space. You know, it's such a nascent sort of industry that you know bringing all the thought leaders into one, converging them into one setting. I think is going to be really really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, second and third day are all about workshops. And Sean will be doing a workshop on the third day. Sean, can, can you tell us a bit more about your workshop? What sure. You talk about? That is October 1st, I believe, is the third day. And I am going to be talking about data augmentation as it applies to computer vision, specifically image image classification. It's it's actually just ripped straight from the course. I'm not going to lie here. It is, it is um, I'm taking one of the lectures and projects from the course. I'm going to compress that to an hour workshop. I'm going to do my best to make it as hands-on as possible, um, but without requiring people to buy hardware. So. What I'm hoping to do is something like uh, give you a, a pre-made data set. Um, it's probably going to be electronic components because that's what we use in the course. Um, we'll fire it up in Edge Impulse and say, here, we're going to train it. And there's only going to be about 50 images per class, which is a very small, terrible data set. Um, you're going to see some problems with it. You're going to see capacitors that are classified as resistors and go, oh yeah, this, this model is terrible. And, and I'm gonna go, no, the model isn't bad. The data set is bad. So then I'm gonna talk about data augmentation where we can actually transform these images and create copies of these images to skew them, zoom, flip them, add noise, all sorts of things. And we're gonna create a much larger data set out of this initial much smaller data set and then retrain using the same model and go, oh, the model went from 90% to 97%. It had everything to do with your data. So the hope is to get people tinkering with uh, image augmentation in something like CoLab and then bringing that into Edge Impulse to see 
how that model is affected. Um, you're not going to need hardware for this. This isn't going to be a hardware deployment kind of thing, but um, I've got a demo. Uh, even in the course, you're welcome to, to try it on hardware. You can do it on like a Raspberry Pi and OpenMV. Um, I'll be honest, I, I'll say I'm working on getting stuff going in Arduino to hopefully support the course, because right now it's all like MicroPython or Python. I want to get stuff working in Arduino. There was just not a lot of good visualization tools and libraries to help me out with the capturing side. The edge impulse tools work great for the model side, um, but it's the capturing side that I'm having troubles with. So I had to say, okay, I'm gonna put that off for later when it comes to giving those into the course. So heads up on that if you're taking the course, um, they're not supported right now. I just wanted to get the course going with some known good stuff. Um, but yeah, so come October 1st, data augmentation, and we'll talk about where data augmentation is good and what its limitations are. And you had just mentioned the word demo, and I know that off air, you and I, we were kind of just briefly discussing maybe showing off something. So I don't know. Do you have something behind the scenes that you might be able to show us, you know, right now? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. And can I share my screen? Do, 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 do. Share screen. I want... Why are you giving me three screens? Oh, one is my laptop. <laughs> While you do that, Sean, I'm just going to bring something up that, that's super interesting. So um, we are, you know... I think I've been in this space for, for a little bit. And what's really interesting is, you know, the fact that we're, I think we're getting to a point where we're starting to realize that actually, um, you know, engineers, software engineers are not just going to be coding anymore, right? They're also going to be working with data, right? And, and I think your workshop um, is going to be really interesting to people that really want to understand how to work with data, right? Because effectively, as you mentioned, sometimes your data sets are small. Sometimes your data sets are not, you know, are not exactly what you would like. And there is ways and techniques to like make sure that you know your data um, can perform or you know what you what you have is is enough for your um, for your models. Or in some cases obviously you have to take to gather more data. But I think it, it's interesting to understand how to play with data in order to get better results from uh, from machine learning models. Uh, so you know go at that come and attend um, Sean's Sean's workshop because it will be really interesting. So Sean, I see your, should I bring up your screen? Yeah, absolutely. Ready? And I agree, much much to your point, um, especially machine learning practitioners, anybody who's gonna be doing doing this stuff in this space, uh, you need to understand how to work with manipulate data, probability, statistics, all of that. So I think as we are getting more into where that's more of a normal, or machine learning is more of a normal subject taught now, probably in a lot of computer science um, curricula, we're going to see that like, oh, you got to understand probability, statistics, data, what that means. So here is my demo. And this is Edge Impulse. If you've played with Edge, Edge Impulse, they should look pretty familiar. I've got some images here. This is a resistor. And if you take my workshop coming in October, these this data set will probably look very familiar. These are, I think they're like 28 by 28, something like that. Um, and we can, I've got background, I've got capacitor, diodes, you know, really basic electronic components. And they're all kind of about the same. They're all kind of, the component body is centered. It's, it's kind of in the same position. You know, the leads are always going out to one side. And it's just, uh, what do I have? About 50 of each. And, you know, there's a few in my test data set over here. Yeah, there's a few in my, you know, like eight items in my test data set. That's a terribly low data set, it's pretty awful. And so I trained this, let's go to my neural network classifier. And what do I have, ha what do I have here? Uh, 2D convolution, 2D convolution, and a dropout layer. I think this is the, the default image classifier for edge impulse, if I remember. And I just upped the number of training cycles to 100 because I just like to throw more epochs at things because reasons. Um, and I, it's a pretty bad accuracy. 90% 90, 90 is uh, taking the tiny ML course, great. Oh, I'm glad you enjoy it, thank you. And it's, it's confusing resistors and diodes here and resistors and diodes, yep. Uh, same with capacitors and LEDs, probably because where the leads are coming out to one side or you've got the two leads going out and like the, the pictures are all the same. So we can make this, work better for us if we do a little bit of image augmentation. And I've got this collab script where this one's just working with one particular image to give you a demonstration. All you would do is just a giant for loop and go through all of your images to create 
more of the same. And here's the original image we're looking at. So we import it. It becomes a, I think, a NumPy array, basically. Where, where am I assigning image here? Yeah, it's basically just, it's just a NumPy array. So you've got, it's originally a 96 by 96. There's three color channels. I draw it here for you. Here's my resistor. And the first thing we can do is flip it. So we flip it vertically, we flip it horizontally, we flip it vertically and horizontally. So now we've got four images from that original one. And that does uh, some interesting things. So first of all, if your model is doing things like, oh, there's always a glint of light on the component body here. And because I see this glint at this particular uh, location, I know that this is a resistor. So we flip it and we trick the model. You go, ha, ah, that glint is not always going to be there. And it ends up going, okay, the model thinks now I have to look at other things like the shape, which is what we're, what we're trying to accomplish here. If you notice that from flipping alone, the leads of the component are still on the edges. So the, so the model may be thinking, okay, I'm, I can still look for your leads on the edges. So that's when we get into rotation. So here's a uh, 45, 90, 135. So here's three more images we can add to this original. And now the component leads can go off to your sides. Ooh, that tricks the model even more. And you could come up with even more rotations than just these. You could have them. You could have it do every ten degrees, and you end up with a dozen or so uh, pictures per original image. So you can see how I'm quickly exponentially growing the number of images from just one image. We can also do random zoom. So we basically uh, zoom in or zoom out and crop in, so it looks like I'm moving the camera around. We can also translate where it's the same zoom level and it you know pretends like we're just moving the camera around there in kind of that same plane. Um, one of the interesting things here is where I add this mode edge. And if you remember, like if you think about where I rotate the image and I've kind of got this area uh, where I don't know what's in there. I've got a question here. I use five images to make an image classifier with five training cycles and mobile net, but it strangely shows an accuracy of 100%. That could be, oh, you're using MobileNet V2. Yeah, uh, if you're using five training cycles, first of all, I bump that up. Um, I don't know. That could be any number of things. It, you could have a naive classifier if you have an unbalanced data set. Um, I would need to know what the image, the image data set you're working with. So if this is something for the course, I would recommend post, posting in the discussion. I can take a look at your, your data set. Um, but yeah, it's probably something to do with the data set. If you're getting 100%, either you means you have an amazing model or you have a terrible model because um, you've created a naive classifier. So it, any number of those, those things, you'll have to test either in deployment or with another test set to see what's going on. Um, so what I was mentioning with this edge here, when I rotate the image or I slide it, you obviously don't have the pixels on the sides where you've moved the image and there's kind of a blank spot. You could do like a constant or static where it just kind of fills it in with black or white. Edge just takes what those edge pixels were and extrapolates them out. That works super well for something with a constant background and something like leads. So the pixels here didn't exist, but because it extrapolates out, you now have a white background with a lead. And it looks like a real image because that's what I would expect it to look like. Now, if you've got a car or something, it's just going to look like stretched pixels. It may or may not work. So once again, lots of testing here for your translations, rotations, just to make sure uh, that's working. Um, the final thing I show is noise, and we've got Gaussian noise and salt and pepper noise. This comes into play when you increase the gain of your, um, like your, your, your sensor, and it tries to um, pick out low light subjects, and it just also introduces a bunch of noise. Um, this is also useful for training the model, not just to look for a particular color or grayscale value at a location, because now it could be slightly different than that. Um, there's all sorts of there's all sorts of things that you can do to augment your data. This is just a few examples. There's also like color shifting, there's stretching, skewing, lots of things I didn't talk about here, and you kind of end up with this idea of, I start with one image, the basic augmentation techniques I showed you, or transforms I showed you gives me 13 new images. So now my data set of 250 goes to over 3000 new images based on this. So one image turns into a, uh, a bunch of different images here. And what we've got is, if I can find my mouse pointer, we go back here, I've got these loaded into Edge Impulse. This is a new project. So now I've got 
500 images instead of those 48 images in my training set per core or per class, that is, you know, something like 3,000 images total between test and training. I train the exact same classifier. As you can see here, it's the same model. I've already trained it, which is hilarious that it's telling me 93% because this, I swear this was giving me 97 when I looked at this exact project earlier today. The but effect I was of a live demo. I know. It literally <laughs> said 97 when I looked at it like five minutes before we started this. So I was able to get up to 97% on the training. We've got we've got model testing. Maybe I'm in a different electronic component CNN augmented. No, I don't know. That was that was super. With the ghost of demo day haunts me. But we trust you. We trust you. <laughs> I swear it was 97. It was higher. <laughs> <laughs> I can train these, and yeah, it's still giving me 90, 93%. But. It's, it should still show you that it is, I saw an increase in accuracy over 90%. So any few percent increases is always helpful using the same model. And to finish out this demo, I've got it deployed on my OpenMV. And so this is just a script that I wrote that captures raw data from my OpenMV, scales it as necessary, and sends it off to the Edge Impulse trained tiny or TensorFlow Lite model file which is actually like a, a collection of operations. And I'm gonna make sure my OpenMV is connected. I'm gonna run this. Um, so be looking up here. This is where it's gonna be classifying. If you can read down here, these are my raw classification outputs, but this is really what you wanna look at in this upper right. Let me turn on my lamp and I've got, you know, my little OpenMV camera here. Let's see if I can point it at, oh, LED. Sometimes it thinks it's a capacitor if I get rid of that round cap a little bit but it actually works pretty well in a variety of rotations where it might not have done that earlier, depending on where I took the original photos. Even, even vertically like this, it still kind of sees it. Now, if I move it side to side, it's confused because that's probably where the model is looking for, um, it's looking at particular pixels in order to classify it. So it thinks it's a capacitor here, but it does a little better when I'm horizontally and I move it around, but if I move it up and down, same kind of thing, huh, that is interesting. More things to play with. Um, diode, it might think it's a resistor because the lead's coming out of the side, but it's actually performing pretty well. I've got my resistor here. Resistor, yeah, even around the sides. It, it confuses a little bit, like if I get rid of the resistor component body, oh, it's a background, but it's actually pretty good when it's more or less centered. That yep. brings up another interesting point, actually. Have you done, have you, are you also going to show how to crop images? Because that's another one that you could do, right? Like you could crop. Yeah, I, I, I did show that one. So if you've got, um, it's the random zoom and crops. Oh, there you so, go. You, you have it there. Yeah. yeah. You have it. So there's translation, there's translation where you kind of move it around and it's the same size, but you also have this where you can zoom in or out. Out's not great because then you end up with like weird borders sometimes. So a lot of times what you'll do with these, um, uh, scale and randomly crop. So you, you randomly crop into certain parts of it and and you use whatever, I think it's like an interpolation, uh, either anti-aliasing or something to, to you know, figure out your, your pixel values in between, yeah. like interpolation. And yeah, you, you kind of zoom into random parts of this and you can do that a whole bunch. So that, Very that, interesting. that concludes the demo. <laughs> I, I'm hoping that uh, for the workshop, I time permitting, I'll get into looking at saliency maps and class activation maps. So you could start to get an idea of how you might try to peek into that black box of a convolutional neural network and get a sense for where is it looking, which pixels and areas is the model looking at, or are the model, is that particular model looking at to figure out, oh, is this a resistor? Is this a capacitor during its classification? Very cool. And I can I, we've got a question. We've got a question from the audience that we'll bring up now. I think it's not really um, directly related to what you've done, but I think it is somewhat related. So let's sure. find it. Um, I got it right I can, here. Uh, bring yeah, it there we go. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, it's an interesting one. Who could point me to a, an image anomaly detection tutorial? I, I'll just start with that, and then, Sean, I'll pass it off to you. But I think from my perspective, I mean, image anomaly, effectively, what you need to do is, is train a classifier to recognize the anomaly, right? So effectively, it's image classification, uh, except you know the, the the images you're showing it are of an anomaly, right? But you're just teaching it to 
train or you train the model to recognize, say, a broken glass from a not broken glass or you know a, a broken pipe from a non broken pi pipe. So effectively, it's just image classification. So if you take any of our tutorials on in image classification or the stuff that Sean has just shown you, uh, maybe take Sean's course. Um, you can you can learn how to do an image classification, and then it's it's all about uh, building the right uh, data set for your anomaly that you have in you know whatever whatever use case. Uh, Sean, I don't know if you've got things to add to that. But sure. Um, uh, uh, anomaly detection gets a little wonky because sometimes you're trying to find things that you don't have data set for. So you get into you start getting into unsupervised learning where you go, I know. I know what I have, but I don't know what I don't have, and I want that to become an anomaly, if that makes sense. So if you can get data for what your anomalies are, you can train that classifier, which is, that's usually the best way to go about it. Um, but sometimes it's like, oh, a spam filter, right? You think about a spam filter and you, and you, you don't have many instances of spam, and you don't know what future spam might look like. So you kind of have to figure out a way to go, I know what real email looks like, but I don't know what bad email looks like. And so there's a whole section of machine learning that gets into unsupervised learning, anomaly detection. Um, usually the easiest way to do that is to say, okay, if I have samples of it, great, train a classifier. If I don't have samples, there's a bunch of stuff out there you can do um, to help with that. And it should just apply to images. It's not, I don't take my word on this because I haven't really dove into this and it's a very good question and now I really want to go tinker with some of these techniques. So one option might be something like um, nearest neighbors where you're looking at pixel values and you go, okay, am I like, can I group stuff together or is my sample on how X number of dimensions, which is like your height by width number of dimensions, where does that appear next to images that I are, are known good? Right. So I've got my image that I just captured. I've got my training set and I go, hey, how far away, how close is my new image to this training set? And I go, if it's outside, I can create some type of distance measure with that based on how far, whether that's like Mahalanobis distance, mean squared error. There's a number of ways to measure that distance and go, if my image is really different from what I expect, then I'm just going to say that's a classifier or excuse me, that's an anomaly. That's one way to do it. That's a common way to do it. Um, it's very computationally expensive to do inference with. That's the downside of doing something like, um, I think that's nearest neighbors. Somebody's going to correct me on that one. Um, right. I, like, I did study this and like, it's like you study for the test or you make the course and then like the knowledge is just gone. <laughs> I mean, we, we have, there's, you know, as you said, there's multiple techniques, right? We have, for example, K-means clustering on, on a gym. Clustering, yeah. Try and use, um, and that's that's another technique. I mean, there's yeah, plenty of techniques, and those are like effectively classical machine learning, right? They're not really uh, they're not really machine learning, like they're not deep neural networks. They're more using like classical machine learning techniques, and that's that's absolutely fine. And you know, sometimes actually, you, you talked about the we talked about DSP at the beginning, right? Sometimes like you have to, it's better actually on an embedded device um, to have to in order to generate a smaller model, uh, it's better to actually uh, you know pre pre, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Re basically do a feature extraction in advance of the of the classifier or do something like, for, for example, k-means clustering in advance. If you find an anomaly, you don't actually need to like pass your data through the classifier itself, right? Because, you know, you've already found an anomaly, uh, for example. So you can try that k-means clustering, but I think, um, so we saw Tektronix actually asked another question or he Could said- I can I jump in real quick before before yeah, that ahead. one? Uh, sorry, because I want to say um, yes. Uh, be careful because there's a there's a balance. Um, so, for example, with your keyword spotting, it's actually more computationally expensive to calculate your male frequency sexual coefficients than it is to run the actual neural network. So it, it's a balance, right? Is are, are my DSP pre-processing steps more expensive than the neural network? And sometimes the answer is yes which there are techniques like you may have a co-processor or maybe maybe there's known techniques you can do in like an FPGA that makes then the neural network part easier for you. Um, one of my other favorite techniques that I want to explore more is uh, autoencoders and that may work well for images. I haven't done a lot of research to see what's out there, but autoencoders where you take an image, I, I basically do like the, the um, 
convolutional side of things down to like a very small representation. And then I reverse that process to try to reconstruct the image. And I go, how close is the original image to this reconstructed image? And you train a classifier on just your, your training set of known good. And if it's actually a large error between the input and the output, then you say, oh, my model couldn't reconstruct it. It's probably outside of this training data, therefore an anomaly. So autoencoders are super cool and potentially another good way to do anomaly detection. So sorry, let's get back to the next question because that was another technique that actually does use neural networks. Yeah, I think, well, it wasn't really a question. He was saying that, um, so Tektronix was saying that um, he had effectively samples that were very similar to each other. So uh, it was hard, but sometimes, you know, I guess, uh, I mean, uh, two things come to mind here. Like one is, uh, you know, get more data potentially. But the other thing is maybe maybe actually um, vision is not the right approach here, right? Like maybe there is other ways to, I, I you know, I think we, we would have to see what the samples are, like what, what is the use case. But in some cases, you know, you're trying to use a sensor that doesn't really, if, you, if your image doesn't look different, then maybe there is another way to detect that, you know, with infrareds or with whatever, like something else. You know, depending on the on the use case, obviously, it, it might be different. Uh, in other cases, I guess um, there is, you know, I think, yeah, I'm trying to think like if the if the camera can't detect it, um, then then I don't know. I, I can't really think of other ways to um, to make to make the data set more detectable. I mean, I don't know. Like Sean, is there a way to augment an anomaly um, to to make it? To make that image kind of um, stand out somehow. Uh, sure, it 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 all comes down to what data you have available. Um, you can you can you know if you only have five anomalies, you can try to do image augmentation and predict what other anomalies, how other anomalies would look similar to that one. So maybe it's like shifted a little, zoomed in a little. If it's like a gray spot on an image, or or like I've got say a resistor that's missing a band, and I want to bin them because that resistor is missing a band then you know, may, maybe creating a bunch of anomalies of, of that particular instance is a good way to go about it. If you know that it's a particular spot in, in the image, you could just zoom in on that spot and just, I'm always gonna look at these four pixels and that's gonna be my classifier. That'll save you a whole lot of computation. Um, you have to think about it in terms of maybe not just images or visual images, maybe it's something that's hotter. So let's go to infrared. Um, Right? Is are there other ways you can get other sensors like Alessandro was talking about on it? Right? Maybe it's not vision. Maybe it's you know think about how how is your anomaly different than your known good data set? So you have to think about all the different possibilities and approach it from multiple angles because pure vision may not give you what you're looking for. Like that's part of the fun fun of machine learning <laughs> is is trying to think about not just how to solve it, but the different ways. And especially when you get into embedded machine learning, what's the most efficient way to solve it? Because now you're talking about limited resources. Yeah, so true. And I think uh, someone once said, uh, we were having a chat and they, they said, think, think like a machine thinks, don't think like a human thinks, right? So in some cases, uh, you should kind of put your, your, yourself in the, in the shoes of the machine and think about, you know, if there are other sensors that a machine could, could use to detect whatever you're trying to detect, right? So that's that's interesting. W one more thing I'll say before we address, there's another question from the audience, but I also wanted to say, Sean, you brought up a good point about like, sometimes like DSP feature extraction is costly versus, you know, like having machine learning uh, models are more costly. Um, I think, you know, I think it's a really challenging thing to like figure out yourself. And in some cases, you know, it takes a lot of trial and error, like a lot of different things, you know, in, in, in engineering, uh, you have to like put the work. Uh, we have released something really interesting that I think is super useful because, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've done this for a while and sometimes like I did, str I struggled to like find that DSP uh, feature extraction balance with the ML model balance. And um, we've, we've released Ian Tuner. So go check it out on Edge Impulse. What it does is, uh, I mean, I'll just, I'll just actually just bring up my screen for a second here. Um, I'll just show you guys like one of the views of, let's see if uh, it comes up. There we go. Uh, I just wanted to show you, like, effectively, uh, this is this is a model that I've got here. It's doing um, it's it's sound. This is recognizing a faucet from uh, from uh, noise, right? A faucet 
with water from noise. Um, and what's interesting here is that you can see in uh, in the tuner that uh, it's it's basically going through different um, combinations of DSP and ML models. And you can see the results and you can see that effectively um, each one has a different DSP and an end split effectively, right? So in some there is more classification and some there is more DSP feature extraction. Um, and you can see the difference. So for example, this has almost like half and half, and then you've got somewhere, you know, there's almost like no neural network, no, no deep learning uh, happening and, and so on. Like there's a lot of different cases uh, so I'd, I'd invite you, like, if you're having that problem to check out uh, the Ian Tuner, because it can give you, um, it can kind of do the work for you and like look at different hyperparameters uh, of the neural network versus uh, parameters of the DSP and really give you uh, the combination that works best for your use case. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop talking about this, but it was uh, something, something interesting that I think, you know, was really useful to me, um, and uh, yeah, and I hope it could be interesting to others as well. So I'll bring this down. And Ari, do you want to bring up the question on Coursera? You're mute. There we go. Technical glitch. Actually, we had one other question in relation to that first. Um, so, Sean, how would you compensate for not having a coprocessor or special hardware for inferencing? How to bolster the CPU for inferencing? Is adding more cores the only option? Uh, man, that is a good question. There is, how do you compensate? I mean, that's, that's like, how do you get something to run faster? Right? Like, so it's, it's, it probably comes down to, you know, you can pick choosing your, your processor appropriately. So like sometimes a Cortex M4 is fine. Um, but you know, for vision applications, it may not be. Um, and so you have to go to like a Cortex M7 just because you're gonna run faster. Um, you can throw more cores at it, um, I, uh, and then or you can spend some time trying to make your feature extraction and neural networks more efficient. Right? It's 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 trying to attack every angle that you can. Um, so if you've worked in embedded for a while, you're probably familiar with. You know, I've got I can do stuff on hardware or I can do stuff in software, or I can try to do both and try to make something as efficient and fast as possible. Um, I mean, the ultimate solution or the the, the sledgehammer approach is usually throw like a, a Raspberry Pi at it because you know that's gonna run it like what a gigahertz these days, um, but you're talking, it's a power hog, right? So it's like, okay, if I wanna run with less power, now I'm gonna have to spend some time choosing my hardware appropriately to make sure it's gonna meet my uh, timing requirements. Like if I only need an image if I only need to look at an image and classify it once every second or every minute, I can use something super low power. But if I need like, you know, 20, 30, 40 frames per second, okay, that's now you're talking like, do I need multiple cores? Do I need special hardware? It, it's 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 every embedded problem ever. It's, it's how do I balance this? Um, how do I get things to be more efficient and well, you know, saving on power, like that's, that's the best I can, I can hope is yeah. More cores is one way is one option. Well, thank you. And then, uh, we had a few questions throughout about, um, is hardware required for the Coursera course? So I understand that, you know, you could probably still participate without the hardware in hand, but to get the full, full experience, we'd recommend probably getting like a nano 33 BLE sense or something like that for the first course. And for the second one, you know, what are your recommendations? Um, probably the OpenMV H7, H7 Plus is probably your best bet. Um, yeah, the hardware for the second course is a little pricier just because we need that processing power. Um, so it's either that or the Raspberry Pi. Um, if you want to play with, if you want to play with microcontrollers, the Open, or yeah, the OpenMV is a really good thing. But like I mentioned, the, um, object detection stuff is not working on that one yet. So right now a Raspberry Pi 4 is kind of the only way to get through the whole course and get your hands on actual hardware. Um, you can definitely take, take you know, do do use the pre-made data sets that I, I made, do the collab exercises, do stuff in Edge Impulse and kind of go, oh, this is a model, this is how it works. You could do all of that and probably get through all of the quizzes without a problem, without needing to buy hardware. I do recommend getting hardware because you get to, there's nothing like holding up an open MV and going, Oh my goodness, it's classifying my dog in real time. And that's super freaking cool. Um, but yeah, for the intro course, the, 
I think the only board that I support is the um, Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense, like already mentioned. And then the second course you want, like the OpenMV, um, doesn't quite work with object detection right now. I hope it does soon in the future. Um, or the Raspberry Pi 4. A lot of people I know who like are makers, engineers, they usually have like a Raspberry Pi sitting around anyway. Um, but you will need the Pi Cam. You could probably get a USB webcam to work with the Raspberry Pi, but that's kind of on you because uh, Linux and USB stuff is always kind of wonky. Um, can't promise any particular webcam will work. So I know that the Pi Cam works. How's that? You're missing the fun. Yes, <laughs> it is. It is like if you're doing embedded machine learning, you should probably get your hands on actual hardware because that is where the fun. I mean, you you get into embedded stuff because you enjoy the hardware side of things anyway, right? Well, that was perfect. So, Sean, I know being mindful of the time. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, you know, as we look ahead, Alessandro, um, maybe one more plug for Imagine. Yeah, I mean, I think um, if you liked all the stuff that we talked about today. So if you are interested in uh, uh, computer vision, in embedded ML in general, uh, you definitely have to watch out uh, for Imagine and, and check it out. Um, so you can register this uh, down here. There is uh, the link that Artie just posted. And uh, overall, I think what you'll find is that uh, we'll make it very easy for everyone to attend. So uh, all this stuff is free. Uh, you can attend online. It will all be uh, streamed to you. Um, streamed online, you know, on the day, and um, you can see a lot of really interesting talks on day one, as we talked about before, and then day two and day three are going to be all about workshops. Uh, so make sure to check out the schedule because there's some uh, partners that are giving out some hardware for the workshops. So if you don't have your embedded uh, kit yet, you might want to subscribe to one of those uh, um, workshops because you, there is a chance to get uh, your hands on some hardware. Um, so other than that, I think just check out the schedule and add uh, the session that you're interested in to your calendar because we'll be sending links uh, to attending to, to attend the actual session uh, through the calendar link. Uh, so make sure to add all the sessions that you're interested on the calendar, on your calendar, um, so you have it all there and it will all be available on the day uh, for you to watch uh, directly. So I can't wait. I mean, there's a lot of uh, really interesting talks and a lot of interesting workshops coming up. Um, and I hope to see you all there next uh, in a couple of weeks now. How many days we have left? Uh, there's a big counter like at the end right? of the ten? 11 days. Uh, 11 days. Yeah. I was just looking and at Sean, the, you're uh, such a pro. So kudos to you, Sean. Like, honestly, I just sat back today. I learned so much just from you just listening. So thank you for joining us. This, this was awesome. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys having me on here. And I, I love geeking out about tiny ML embedded machine learning stuff. This is a lot of fun. And I, I, I think I mentioned, um, oh, I mentioned, I mentioned, where was that? Yeah, I was talking to somebody and I mentioned like, I, I get the feeling that this embedded machine, or machine learning in general, but especially embedded machine learning is turning into what I would think was DSP in the 80s, where that kind of changed some of the industry in as far as DSP became this new thing you could do with microcontrollers, FPGAs, um, and how the embedded world worked. And I'm really excited to see where embedded machine learning takes us into the future. So thank you guys for having me on here and letting me geek out about this stuff. No, this no it's so great. great. And and I, I completely agree. I think, you know, I'm really looking forward to, to the time when uh, there's going to be as many uh, as many data engineers as like software engineers, right? Like I think we're going towards a world where uh, it makes sense to make it makes sense to make more sense of data. Is that that's that's a bit sure. of a mouthful? <laughs> but, but I think I think you know we 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 are throwing away a lot of data right now. Like a lot of sensors, you know, are sending really kind of um, stream. They're streaming like some data to the cloud, and most of the data is just being thrown away. You know, wouldn't it be much cooler if we could make sense of all that data and not waste all that power on like useless uh, data collection, right? So I think, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, what we can do in the next couple of years together. Yeah. Uh, and Ooh. and I to that real quick, like I, I track my sleep with like the Apple sleep tracking, auto sleep or whatever. And it, it gives me a bunch of data. But I think where machine learning is going to really help us, whether that's, you know, big cloud server stuff or, or embedded stuff is helping me make sense of that going, what are the patterns? Tell me, you know, use principal component analysis to tell me what things factor into my sleep here. Cause I don't know. 
I, that's where I'm hoping some of this goes as well. There we go. I think we can end on this. I love it. Cooler. And better than mouse cooler. <laughs> thank you all for watching. Arjit, thank you so much for all your, your comments in there. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sean. And Artie, I'll give it to you. Close it. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And uh, hopefully we'll see you sooner than uh, the gap last time, maybe in a few weeks. Um, definitely look out for another episode early October. This was thank awesome. You. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Take care, Bye. guys.